Well, it's time to time to begin. I want to thank you guys uh, for being a part of our study this quarter. I think I think we've had a fantastic uh, quarter uh, looking at the best husband ever. I, I feel indebted to each of the men that came in and uh, participated in the class. Uh, several that uh, even outside the congregation that, that came in and shared some great thoughts uh, that helped all of us to, to think more seriously about the challenge of loving with the love of Jesus Christ. And uh, as we've said each week, we have a model. Uh, that model is Jesus. How, how am I supposed to be a better husband? Uh, by, by loving uh, with the example of Jesus in mind. Uh, that model, that mindset then is the, you know, the golden rule. Sometimes with the golden rule, especially in our closest relationships, instead of asking, you know, how would I want to be treated and then treating the other person that way, we make the mistake of comparing. So well, she, didn't, she didn't treat me the way I want to be treated, and then maybe I'm going to you know, respond differently. That's not, the rule. That's not the rule. The rule that Jesus gave us isn't treat people the way they're treating you. And so when we get that model and that mindset, it really is challenging, and it will change the dynamic of your marriage, and it, the, the change is positive. Uh, the change is a blessing. And so that's what we've been doing. Fred Rhodes, uh, one of our elders here, uh, has agreed to, to come and be the last uh, interview for the quarter. His subject is uh, on the importance of being gracious. And so as we get started, I've asked him if he would lead us in prayer, and then we'll get into the interview. Let's bow together. Father, we humbly come before your throne this evening thanking you so much that we have a relationship with you that is simply priceless. Father, we know that in your great wisdom that you've given us your word to help us, to guide us, to know every single day what we need to do to please you. And Father, we're thankful for in your great wisdom that you established the church that allows us to be with fellow Christians, to encourage one another, to help one another in our journey to heaven. Father, be with us tonight. Help us to be able to look for ideas that will help us in our marriages to be better husbands, to be better fathers, to be good examples to others. And Father, most importantly, we're thankful for your Son, Christ. It's in His name that we pray. Amen. Part of, the, part of the fun of the class is finding out how you know, people met and uh, how long they've been married. I think one of my favorites was our, our very first session with Shorty when he talked about being a college guy and you know, she was in high school and how impressed she must have been. And I think she said, that guy looks like a grasshopper, the way he was sitting in the car and his knees were sticking up. So it doesn't always work out the way we think it is, uh, is going to. How, how long have you been married, Fred? 41 years. Um, we were married in July of 1976, so a little over 41 years. But we did date five years before we got married, and um, so I feel like, you know, we've been together all of our lives, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much time prior to not knowing Pam. And how, how then did you meet? At church. Um, <clears throat> Pam's family, the Tyson family, um, her grandfather helped establish the church in Lone Wolf, and my dad had taught school uh, bef way before I was born. Uh, he was teaching in a little country school outside of Blair, if any of you know southwest Oklahoma. Uh, dad was teaching school there and preached in Lone Wolf. Uh, there were four of us in our family. Two children were born. I'm the youngest. The two oldest sisters were born during that period of time. And then uh, dad moved, mom and dad moved off, and um, he came back to Lone Wolf to preach later. Um, and I think there's a period of about 13 years there. But our families were friends the very first time my dad preached there. Um, Pam has a brother, Gary, and I have a sister that are the same age. And we have a picture of a church picnic at the park at Lone Wolf where both our moms are pregnant uh, with our siblings. So... Um, we met at church. Her family has always been a part of that church. So when we moved back to Lone Wolf, that's when we met. 
You know, I don't think I've, I've asked this question to anybody else, but it's a good question. Why, why did you choose Pam as your lifetime companion? I could talk the rest of the time about Pam. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I'm sorry that this is being videoed because, um, and I really need you all to not say anything to Pam about anything that I say, <laughs> because because she's not going to see it on the video. She will not be view this as being gracious. Um, <laughs> Pam, Pam is. I'm not going to say she's a private person, but she really doesn't want to be talked about. You know. Um, but she's worthy of being talked about because I think she's a great example. I, I learned real early on um, in the youth group that Pam was very serious about church and about her relationship with God. She was, she's just always been very mature about that. And there were little hints along the way. I mean, you have to think back that I met her when I was 12. We started dating when I was 15 and she was 16. And I'll talk about that a little bit later too. But um, I, we would, in, in Bible class, we would raise our hands every Sunday morning if we were daily Bible readers. She was always raising her hand. And then one thing that really impressed me, um, there was a, a lady, we called her Sister Sykes. Her husband was over Westview Boys Home, and they had organized a thing at Mangum some evening that all the women were going to go hear Sister Sykes for like a ladies' Bible class. And she had this method of marking your Bibles, that you would go through your Bible and put these little you know, symbols and things through your Bible to help you find different Bible stories and things. And we were, would have only been about 14 or 15, but Pam said, well, I'm going to go to that. And I thought, wow, you know, you're, you're a kid. You know, but this is, I was thinking of that was something for older ladies to go do, but she wanted to do that. Um, that impressed me. And in addition to having the last name Tyson, I mean, I've said this a lot, but uh, the Tyson family, they're just salt of the earth people. Um, probably embarrassing, Matt, but uh, they really are. All of the Tyson people are just rock solid, very sound in the faith. Um, and I, I knew there were actually three Tyson girls in the youth group. Um, so any one of them would have been uh, good to have uh, as a wife, but Pam and I had more, more in common. Okay, uh, as we think about our theme of be gracious, in, in your opinion, as you think about that, what, what, what does that mean to you to be a gracious husband? I, the word that comes to me initially is being thankful. If we're gracious, uh, we're thankful. Uh, there are other words I think of, of uh, being appreciative, being uh, appreciative and considerate, understanding, compassionate. I think there are a lot of words that, that could help us maybe define what it is to be gracious. But but being thankful, being the kind of person that shows that kind of gratitude in, in, in everything that you do. Is that, uh, you know, one of the things that we've noticed in the class, uh, you know, different, different people have addressed different aspects of, of being the best husband ever. And, uh, you know, what we've asked is, have you always been uh, gracious? Is this something that, that comes naturally to you? Is it something you think over the course of, how many years did you say, 41, 41 years? Yeah. Uh, that, that you've grown in this area? What, what do you think about that? I'm laughing because really Pam would be the one to be answering that question instead of me. Um, <clears throat> have I been a gracious husband always? I, no, I don't think I have. Um, I don't really want to give you examples of that, but I do think that... Uh, feel free to give <laughs> examples. <laughs> Look into the I, camera that's at the back I, of the classroom. I, w I will say that I, I will say that I had a really good role model in my parents and in their marriage. Um, I mean, I th every, all of us have different experiences growing up and what our parents and our relationships might have been like. But I will say that uh, my parents, and I'm going to say we're madly in love. My parents, we just knew growing up that our parents just loved each other. I mean, they, you know, we were their children and they loved us, but we knew if something happened and we were wiped off the face of the earth, they would be, I mean, it, it was always, it was about, you know, their relationship. Um, they, they were just two people that just had fun together. So I had that, that role model. Um, I'm not saying that necessarily that I married someone like my mother, but 
Um, Pam does have a real calm temperament, and uh, my mom was calm in her temperament. My dad happened to be more of a emotional, high-low, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there have been times that I had, and, and I'm going to say probably more early marriage, that, you know, there might be things that bothered me, and I just go out and mow the lawn, you know. <laughs> I would um, get out and work out my frustration by going and doing something physical to uh, get away from the situation. But um, I hope I have been. I, I had a good role model for it, I'll put it that way. There, there is a joke about uh, the guy was married for 50 years and uh, newly went asking the secret of his success. And he said, when I was wrong, I admitted it. And when I was right, I took a, a long walk outside. And the secret is I've lived a mainly outdoor life would be the <laughs> way that that guy told it. That's not what Fred said. Um, well, I will tell you, um, we're, we're going to get into this about mm -hmm. the, the tongue and, and maybe taming the tongue is one of the scriptures I want us to look at. But um, we were dating. We were at Oklahoma Christian, and back then you had study carols. And I can specifically remember, there, Pam, for some reason, I had no reason. I didn't, under, I didn't know what it was, but she had some reason that she was upset with me. But she wouldn't tell me. And I couldn't get her to talk about it. And we were in different study carols, and I remember going over to her study carol and saying, if you don't tell me why you're upset with me, I cannot marry you. I cannot live with somebody that will not tell me. It may really bother me for you to tell me what I'm not doing right. <laughs> but I'd rather you tell me and me deal with it. And, of course, the joke is, you know, you get what you ask, you ask for. for. And you're <laughs> <laughs> now... No, she's... <laughs> I could live happily and not know some of these things. Yes, really. No, that's good. And I, I agree with that. And I, I wish, you know, some of the advice we, we give for husbands and wives is we, we can't read each other's minds. If there's a problem, I can't guess at what it is. And, uh, and I think that's, that's also a good example of that story. Um, the relationship then between graciousness and kindness. How, how do you see those two things being connected? I, I kind of look at graciousness as something that comes from the heart and kindness as being putting that into action. Good. Using a scripture, uh, faith without works is dead. <clears throat> graciousness without kindness is dead, is what I would say, because I think we could say that and believe that we're gracious, but are we really putting that into action? Are we, are we doing things that uh, are kind? Are we really considerate? Uh, not just something that we are thinking, but um, are we putting that into practice? I, I will tell you there are some differences, and for those of you that are married, you know that there are differences, and, and hopefully we marry somebody that can compliment us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and that Luke would not like me to say this, but I, I look at Luke and Ashley in their marriage, and Luke <laughs> married somebody that is a compliment to him. Ashley is more outgoing and, you know, and that, to me, that's a healthy marriage. Um, Pam is really a smart person, um, and this is where she would really be upset with me that I would say this, but Pam is like being married to Google. Um, you know, she just, she has read her How would that whole, be upsetting? I think it's okay. <laughs> tremendous. Well, she doesn't. She just didn't like people. I, I she ask, didn't want me to talk about her. Yeah, but I'd like everyone in the class to not call her Google when you see her in the hallway after class because it could create tension. Pam, um, she's always... You you, did, she has always read books. I mean, mm -hmm. she has just always read. And, and one of the stories about her on reading is that the little librarian, Hobart, would close at noon on Saturdays and um, her mom would take her there the minute they opened and she would, the limit was seven books <clears throat> and she'd check out seven books, they'd go home and then Pam went to her mom and go, you know, let's go back to the library before they close and she'd go, we just checked out seven books mm -hmm. and she'd say, yeah, I've already read them. I mean, she just, <laughs> she was ready for seven more. And so I, the grades that I made in school are because I've, I'm an overachiever. I'm really not a bright person, but Pam's a bright person. So I think we marry people that compliment us, and we should. Um, now, I, there are some things along the way that I learned 
to how to be gracious. And part of that is like learning what what you, their dif- your differences are and how you kind of stay out of each mm-hmm. other's way. Um, and by that, I mean, I'm a, a morning person and Pam is a night person. Um, early marriage, she had, and she would tell me this when we were dating, you know, like at 12 o'clock, she might start baking a cake or something because she liked to bake cakes and decorate them. And, and I didn't register, that didn't register with me. But so we're early marriage and you know, late at night, like for me, it's 10 o'clock. I go to, now I go to bed most usually at 9 or 9.30. Um, and so it's like, okay, let's like recover that couch. And we're starting it like at 10 o'clock and I'm thinking, okay, I want to please her, so let's do that. And then I get grouchy. I get really not nice. Um, and you have a staple gun in your hand. Yeah, you know? that's not good. That is not a good combination. So, um, I, but I wanted to please her. You know, I wanted to do what she wanted to do with those projects. And I learned that is probably not the way to do it. And, you know, your first house, at least for us, was a one that we were going to work on because we didn't buy it in perfect condition. But uh, we had a house in the village that, I mean, we did everything, electrical, plumbing, tore out the kitchen and cabinets and did, did all this stuff. Uh, but anyway, I learned I couldn't do that late at night. I couldn't do projects late at night. Um, one thing I learned is that she's not a morning person. So I learned that we don't talk in the mornings. That's just, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. And, and she's like, just, just, just be calm. Um, in early marriage, um, I, I mean, I act like, you know, as far as making adjustments, that I made the adjustments, but she had to make adjustments too. Uh, they were a Crest family. We were, were a Colgate family, so we're now a Colgate family. Um, but actually, early marriage, we could only afford one tube of toothpaste, so we shared it. But uh, now we have our own, so that kind of solves that. But we're, I, we were a Colgate family. Um, ketchup, we had two different brands of ketchup. And, and the one thing I did win on was ketchup. And Pam is always right. She's just always right because she reads everything and she knows. But their family had ketchup out on the table. Not in the fridge. Not in the fridge. And I said, but you're supposed to have it in the refrigerator. And so I felt so good because I could prove to her. I said, look, right here on the label, it says, refrigerate after opening. <laughs> so I, I won on that one. Um, I, I did learn. So do you put the ketchup in the refrigerator The ketchup's now? in the refrigerator, okay, good, yeah. Good. Um, we were a Miracle Whip family. They were a mayonnaise family. We have mayonnaise. Yeah, you did that uh, wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> the... Um, I didn't like broccoli. I've learned to like broccoli. We didn't eat spaghetti. I eat spaghetti. So, I mean, I did, I did make we, some adjustments, but she probably had a, to make more. We got more. a steamer as a wedding gift, and Tawny made steamed vegetables one. It was great, and I, and I like that. She does not. Broccoli, and I'm enjoying it. It's just the two of us. Nobody else is around. And as I'm enjoying what she cooks, she's sitting next to me trying to eat it like this. <coughs> Uh, and I said, you know, I would enjoy this wonderful dinner more if you'd stop trying to eat that broccoli. But there are differences, and we do have to navigate, don't we? The, the one thing that I could never, I just couldn't do it, is the liver. She loves uh-huh. liver, and I just can't stand can't, it. Can't do it. Can't do um, it. And so she did, and she would say, but you need to try it. And, there's, and I did. And then she'd say, well, and I'd go, it's still not good. And she said, well, I think... I think if I cook it differently and like if you smother it with a bunch of sauce or something, then that didn't help. And then she said, I think maybe if I grind it up and put it in spaghetti (laughs) with hamburger meat. I mean, none, it, nothing works. So we don't, she likes to eat liver when we go out to eat if there's some place. But anyway. Okay. Let's talk about our speech and graciousness, what we say, how we say it, and the things that we are wise enough not to say, the things we leave unsaid. My... My mom, I mean, really was just 
a perfect person in my mind. I mean, my mom was so godly, and she taught me as a young child, as soon as those words go out of your mm-hmm. mouth, you can never put them back in. And so always think about what you're going to say before you say it. And so I've, I've tried to live by that. Obviously, I haven't always done that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 3. <clears throat> and I think this is probably the best passage um, that I can point to about our tongue. And it's really, I think it's really good because it talks about kind of how dangerous the tongue is if we're not careful. Uh, Starting in uh, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what he says is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have, made, who have been made in God's likeness. One of, or out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So that's one passage. Another one is Proverbs chapter 15, and and this was quoted in our family quite a bit. Um, My my mom, I'll tell you a story after we read this. But we we memorize scripture. We were required to memorize scripture, which is a good thing. Um, If we got in a fight... And I don't mean there was never physical fighting allowed in our home, but um, I considered having boots on and kicking my sisters being okay, and but it wasn't. Um, but if we were in a fight, my dad would say, "What does Romans twelve twenty one say?" And we would have to quote, have to quote. I shouldn't say it that way. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a passage that my mom. Uh, had us quote, a soft answer turneth away wrath from Proverbs 15. Um, my mom would um, not, she wouldn't raise her voice, but if I was arguing with my sister, she would just come through the room where we were and start singing, angry words, oh let them never. And I would look at my sister and we would just start laughing because it's like, are you kidding me? You're sick. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's the kind of thing that just stabs you because you're like, I am so guilty right now. Um, so a soft answer turneth away wrath. I think some people have the idea that, you know, you need to be nice in public, but at home, you know, you can be a different person. But I think we need to always remember that, you know, Pam is not only my wife, she's my sister in Christ. And so that that relationship has to be Uh, pure and holy and and good no matter where or when. Um, I'll give you an example that uh, as a dad, and I I know all of you feel this way, that I have felt such an obligation to to train our boys uh, the way that they should be. And I, I took that responsibility very seriously. And the reason that I did is early on, I, some, maybe a preacher or somebody said, you realize that the picture that a child has of God, because we talk to our children and you call your father your father, and so how you're, you as a father are treating your children, that's the picture they're going to have of God. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, my relationship with our sons is so important because they're going to initially learn 
and think about who God is based on the kind of life I live. So the boys were complaining one time about a, a meal that Pam had cooked. And by the way, I, I don't cook. I have no clue how to cook. Neither does Luke. Uh, we can survive on sandwiches and opening a can of soup, but Hunter is really a good cook. But they were complaining about a meal, and I pulled them aside, and this was you know, when they were really young, and I said, guys, your mother prepared a meal for you. <laughs> she did it all. You just don't complain. I mean, if somebody is willing to prepare mm-hmm. a, and serve me a meal, that's enough right there, you know. Uh, just don't be critical of it, and I don't know that they are, but um, we may not all have preferences about food, but anyway, our tongue's important. What we say is important. I think Cecil May Jr. is the one that, because there's four different authors of the book that we've we've used as a basis, and I think the author of this chapter was uh, Cecil May Jr. There was a little quote at, right at the beginning. I can't remember the exact wording, but Something along the lines of the, the kindest thing we can, you know, say is the unkind thing that we don't say. So, sometimes you have to really think: is it is it worth it to say this? I like the way once it's out there, you can't take it back, and you've got to really think through what you say, how you say it. Sarcasm is not going to work in your favor, being demeaning or mean spirited, and then sometimes it's just not worth saying. Um, you can apologize for it, but you can't unsay it. And so being being gracious in your speech is pretty important. Was there anything else you wanted to say on that no, subject? No, that one, no. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 8, there's a section about husbands and wives, or it's in a section about husbands and wives. Uh, Peter commands, the phrase is, all of you to be courteous in verse 8. It follows uh, the first seven verses uh, really focus on husbands and wives. How important is courtesy uh, to a gracious husband. And what, and what does that even mean? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to read the passage starting in verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Well, that mm-hmm. says to me that that could get in, in our way of, of the right I, relationship. Yeah. With, let, let me just tell you that, that right there, when you, and I've, and I've not proud to admit this, but I've had this experience even, even recently where I was impatient and then it was time to say a prayer together before we went to bed. That makes it difficult because when, when you are not gracious and you're supposed to be the spiritual leader and now it's time for you to lead a prayer, this relationship between husband and wife does affect this relationship between man and God. And that's just a strong teaching, and you don't, you don't want to do that wrong. Yeah, and then, and then the second part of that is in verse 9, is talks about you know, being a blessing. Um, repay evil with good. <clears throat> uh, if you want to be blessed, you're going to need to, to be a blessing to other people. So courtesy. What are some ways to show courtesy? I, I really believe that we have to learn what our wives want and what we think they want may be different than what they really want. And I'll give examples of how I've really messed up on that. Um, I, at the top of my list in my notes, I wrote flowers. And I know everybody thinks that, okay, flowers. Pam loves flowers. I mean, she absolutely loves flowers, and I probably don't buy them often enough. Um, and, and Pam wouldn't even, I started to say, she wouldn't even care if I went out and picked them somewhere. I mean, she just loves flowers. So learn what is important and what pleases them. Um, I have learned what not, I have learned some things not to do that would make me more courteous when I don't do them. I've learned not to load the dishwasher um, because she has a specific way. She wants the dishwasher loaded. There's a way that I think is more efficient. Um, and I, I early on loaded the dishwasher and then I came through another time and it was rearranged. And so I thought, okay, 
she doesn't want me to load the dishwasher. And so we had conversation about it. And she said, the way that you load it, all of the things aren't going to get clean. So I thought, okay, uh, I'll, I'll learn to not do that. Now, here's really the kind of crazy thing. Um, and I can't believe I'm telling you this, but I, I, I did some things early marriage that were not smart. Um, you have to remember, my, my mom and dad's marriage worked for them. It would not necessarily work for other people. <clears throat> my mom dearly loved my father, and she waited on him. I mean, all the time. And I'm excited about that where this was, is going. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't, I mean, honestly, I didn't want that kind of marriage. I mean, I wanted more adult-to-adult relationship, mm-hmm. you know. But, uh, and, and this is crazy, I know it is, but my mom actually, when she would serve my father a meal, she actually cut up his meat. I mean, I know that's weird, but she did that. Okay, so I have that role model, and I want to be a good husband. And we're like, first week of marriage. And we remember we have one tube of toothpaste, and it's Colgate. And I put toothpaste on her toothbrush. And we're getting ready for bed. And she looked at me and said, I think I can put my own toothpaste on my toothbrush. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'll be courteous and not do that. But I thought I was being courteous. Um, and now that I think about it, that's crazy. Why did I do that? I was just thought I was being helpful. Um, okay, the other thing that I did, I'm a, a pretty neat freak. And I just can't wait to do that tonight, just to see the look on her face. There you go, babe. I'm going to really slather it on there, too. Really good. But I'm going to do it in a courteous way. <laughs> I, all of my clothes are organized in the closet. You know, shirts hang a certain way, pants hang. Yes. I mean, it's all organized. And so I organized her clothes. <laughs> I did. I cleaned her purse one time for her. <laughs> she was not thankful. It was, <laughs> wait, that was not courteous. That was the only time I ever did it. Yeah, well, okay, so Pam, she really did it in a gentle way. She said, Fred, it is okay for you to be obsessive compulsive. That is okay. You just can't impose it on other people. <laughs> and you can. I, I, I never know. thought about being neat as being a mental disorder. <laughs> but keep in mind, she called it a mental disorder. <laughs> Our first fight was over how she hung things in the closet. You can't put hangers this way and this way. That's insane. So we're on the same page. Yes, I think you're brilliant. Um, (laughs) I did, um, I I really have learned. I mean, you know, you, after a while, 41 years, you hopefully learn. But I, okay, I'm at a desk. I have one thing out and I work on that. And I need to do that because I've learned if I have a lot of things out, I'll just flip. I'll just keep, that distracts me and I need to focus on one thing. She walked in my office one time at Will Rogers when I was principal there and she said, people are going to think you don't work. (laughs) And I said, why? And she said, your desk is too clean. And I said, that's how I work best is one thing out. So what had been happening early marriage was I organized the house like I did the closet. And, And what I learned is that her brain is different in that she needs, I mean, she might have file folders out, stacks of things. And I said, you know, those will just go in a drawer. <laughs> it's probably not good for us to spend too much time together, Fred. I, we, we would encourage each other. Here's what she said. She said, I love it. if it's in a drawer, I'll forget that I need to take care of it. And I said, and that's what my post-it note's for. <laughs> But anyway, I've I, just I, learned. I think you're a genius. <laughs> I've, we, brains are different. You know, I mean, I knew her brain was different from mine early on, but it's, and I do appreciate her brain, by the way. But um, anyway, enough okay. on that one. No, I, listen, but the point, although we're having a lot of fun, is valid. There are some ways that we can be gracious 
by what we do for our wives, but I think you're making a, a very important point. One way to be gracious is by not doing certain things uh, that they appreciate that we stop doing those things, like organizing her side of the closet. Um, when we think about our relationship with God, obviously graciousness inseparable from forgiveness. And so uh, does being a gracious husband require that we initiate forgiveness in our marriage? I'm going to repeat what I said earlier, that Pam's not only my wife, she's my sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. And Matthew chapter 18, verse 22, Jesus has asked the question, you know, how many times am I supposed to forgive my brother? And some versions say 70 times 7, I think uh, King James says that. Some say um, 70 instead of 7. But whatever it is, the point is we're to forgive others as many times as we want Christ to forgive us. Mm -hmm. So the point is indefinite. I mean, Absolutely. we just... Uh, but anyway... With that's... regard to that question, what do you think about the word initiate? And how does, that, how does that play into being the spiritual head of the home? I, well, it's just important to be that kind of person that um, will initiate the forgiveness. I know, hopefully this isn't abnormal, but we do, you know, lose, we want things to go a certain way mm -hmm. at times. And I, I do, I'm going to go back to my mom and my dad too. My dad really taught us to swallow our pride mm -hmm. and to go and ask for forgiveness and be the first one to do that. Um, and I've, I've just learned, and hopefully we've all learned this as we mature, it's just better to just admit, you know, I did something wrong. I'm sorry that I, mm -hmm. you know, said what I said or whatever. Um, but yeah. It's and the sooner the better, right? Yeah. Uh, you may have already answered this because you talked about your parents earlier. Uh, most gracious husband, that kind of a, as far as a role model that you've ever met, and then what did you learn from that person? Actually, I, my dad was not the first person I thought of. Um, Charles Williams is the first person I thought of when I thought about a gracious husband. I, and of course, Charles Williams is just a gracious person. Um, but I have watched him take care of Joyce when she had health problems and how he just took over. And with situations, uh, I have an uncle that his, my aunt had crippling arthritis really fairly early. And being around him, I observed how he took care of her, uh, helping her just get up out of chairs and things. And, and later in life, I saw my dad be, when my mom got cancer and dad had to cook, which was kind of hilarious in some ways. Um, because he had never cooked. I didn't have a good role model for men cooking. Um, but mom would be, she couldn't get out of bed, so she was in the bed, and my dad would go, Christine, how do you, you know, and he was in the kitchen trying to figure everything out. But um, I, Charles Williams is the one who immediately comes to my mind. Ron, Ronnie Lane sent me some, I think it was Mother's Day, and it was a cartoon of, his wife had breakfast in bed this morning, and in the cartoon, the husband had wheeled her in front of the stove so that she could, <laughs> she was still in bed, but she could cook, so not quite that bad, but he had to call for instructions. Oh, he had to have, yeah. You, you've already shared a few key verses, uh, but maybe there's some others that remind us either of the importance of being gracious, or they remind us of the importance of marrying a, a righteous uh, woman. The very first passage that comes to my mind about being gracious is the story of the ten lepers from Luke chapter uh, 17. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that story, but it says in verse 15, I mean, of course, all of them had been healed. It says verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then Jesus said, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? That's the first passage I think of when I think about uh, the importance of being gracious uh, and being thankful for what we have. There are other passages, um, but that's the one that comes to my mind. How about uh, marrying a righteous person? I, um, I've had a lot of notes, and I'll just quickly tell you, um, we have a lot of biblical examples of when men listen to their wives and they shouldn't have. <laughs> Adam and Eve. Um, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he was led astray by them. Um, I, I will just say this about Pam, that 
the reason I did marry her was because I wanted to go to heaven. <clears throat> and I knew that I had found, I mean, I knew I wanted to marry her before I ever dated her, which is really weird. But I just did because I knew she had such maturity uh, with her, her walk with God. And, but I'll also say this about marriage. Just because a person is a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be compatible. Mm -hmm. um, Pam was more into reading, obviously. She, early on, she did not like sports. She just didn't until her boys started playing sports. And now she is like the biggest Thunder fan there is, and I'm just going, you are not the woman I married. Um, she wants this season is a tickets. good development. Yeah, though. well, I guess. I mean, but anyway, um, there are a lot of passages I think that teach us how to have a good marriage, and as far as our wives and following their example, and some that we shouldn't. Uh, the, the bell was a five-minute <coughs> warning. Uh, any any final advice? Additional advice for the men in the class. I have one story to tell, um, not my story, but a story that I heard a long time ago in a marriage enrichment seminar, and it's always stayed with me of how important our wives are. Um, I, let me back up and tell you, there's a, we have passages about qualifications for deacons and elders, mm -hmm. and in there is how, I mean, let those, any of us that are in church leadership, we can't, we don't, we're not qualified. <laughs> We're not qualified for that office, that position, that role in the Lord's church if our wives are not the kind of people that, that they should be, <clears throat> which I think that's very significant. Um, but there's a story about a mayor of a community and his wife uh, went to his office one day and they were going to go eat lunch together. And he stopped, she stopped by his office and they were walking on the sidewalk to go to the restaurant for lunch. And there's this uh, building under construction and it's multi-story. And, you know, he's the mayor. You know, that's important. And um, up on this, I think the guy was welding or something like that up on this uh, building, the steel work. And she waves at this guy and he waves at her and they seem very friendly and they keep she keeps walking with her husband. And I mean, this is a blue collar worker, right? You know, here he is mayor. And her husband turned to her and said, who is that? And she said, oh, it's a guy from high school. And she said, in fact, I almost married him. And her husband said, aren't you glad you married me? I'm mayor. And she said, I'm really thankful that I married you, but if I would have married him, he would be mayor. <laughs> so that story has always I didn't see stayed that one coming. I like that. It's always stayed with me because I, who am I today? I'm I am who I am today as a Christian, as a leader, because of Pam. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question for prayer. Yes, sir. There's a whole lifestyle that says that your taste changes every thirteen years. How long has it been since you tasted liver? It's been probably 40 years ago since I tasted liver. I think you're off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, what a, what a great <coughs> class the whole quarter. Appreciate all the men that participated. Appreciate all of you for being so supportive of the class. And I think we've ended on a high note. So thank you, Fred. And thank you all for, for being part of our class. It's been a great quarter.